suckers. Sharing screen is for suckers. It doesn't look as nice either. It does not. But how how does um, yes recording now? Okay. Hi, <laughs> welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. The Julia's taking over the Change Eleven and DTLT today <laughs> session. Dave's already gone to a whole bunch of uh, talks, and now this is the one he's most afraid of. Frightened. <laughs> frightened. But he doesn't need to be frightened because we're yeah, all so. very welcoming. So everybody already knows Timmy, Dave. Timmy boy yelled at us. Oh, is it Timmy you're afraid of? Not really. Oh, Timmy's a lover, not a hater. Don't I worry. was I was trying to remember why I said that, and I think it's because I was tired. <laughs> you actually weren't even part of those discussions. If you were there, you would have been. Um, it would have been different. But anyway. no, I mean, I mean, on on Sunday night, I'm trying to remember why I said it was going to be scary. I can't remember now. Maybe because Dr. Garcia was supposed to be here, but she's maybe that's what it is. She's now working for the man and no longer a nomad. So. Oh. She's yeah, she's chained to a desk. <laughs> She's chained to a desk. <laughs> this is all being recorded. Okay. Uh, we have the other nomad who's actually wandering around Brock University, and he's going to try and connect. Al Levine was in part of this session, and he'll be popping in any second. And uh, so I'm Julia, and I'm at Brock University. And then we have Lindsay, who wrote about rhizomes first. Uh, Lindsay, Leslie, oh, who wrote Leslie. about <laughs> rhizomes first. Who inspired well, my drawing? We wrote about rhizomes first, but uh, oh, I mean, but it was the first blog response that I had read since uh, Dave had done all his writings, because you did it for ECI mm. eight three one eight three one, and then I've invited Zach because Zach Dowell, introduce yourself, Zach. Today. My name is Zach Dowell, and I'm a faculty member and the faculty instructional design development coordinator at Folsom Lake College, a public community college in California. He's also a master gardener, so I thought cool. it would be neat to have. A, as a long as he's not a Deleuze scholar, we're fine. We're not. Uh, we're not going to get into any of that because I actually tried to have a conversation with somebody <laughs> else about it, and it just it didn't go well. So I don't want to. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> I tried to take a whole bunch of um, the posts that I read and put them all into that document that you would see on your left. Yeah. Now I don't know if Timmy, who's recording, is going to have to. He's going to have to keep track here. Which is probably why he wants me to share my screen. He can record his screen. You gotta yeah. click on the word so rhizome, he... Timmy. You gotta click on the doc. Click yeah. on the rhizome doc. Wait, I have that somewhere. And it's, com the... it's completely nonlinear. I only just threw them up there so that if I wa we wanted to talk about something particular, the first slide uh, has the musical, whatever that is. From the start of the book. There's nothing on the left hand side under documents. Oh, Timmy, you can't use you can't use Google Plus as pages. You've got to use it as you. What's There's he doing? There's a way to say I'm using it as pages or I'm using it as me, and you're you're logged in as a page, so that's probably not going to work. Goodbye. <laughs> Why does he just come and be Timmy? Exactly. Come back when you're real. Eduardo <laughs> Ortega, hello and welcome. <laughs> Now. Yeah, Timmy, just join the conversation. So, Dave, you want to share your screen? Not really. I was just playing around. Okay. <laughs> you, you've left me alone for like five minutes, and I'm all like, squirrel. So. <laughs> Think about Alan. He's actually outside seeing squirrels. Dog. So. That's why he keeps disconnecting, maybe. Sorry. I, I'm not sharing my screen. That was me. It's Dave. He's just messing around. Sorry. Can we get started here? Come on, we don't have all day. What kind People of operation are you running anyway? People have to work, you know. <laughs> Dave, explain. <laughs> uh, right. Are you saying that we're not going to be on DTLT today? Oh. OK, let's start again. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> I 
I really want to talk about this. First of all, David, tell me, Dave, tell me what's going on with this uh, this graphic that they used. Uh, you mean the one for the start of the uh, from the start of the book? Yeah. I, you know what? That's one of those things that I look at every time I open the book and I go, I wonder what's going on with that graphic they used at the start of the book. Um, I'm assuming it's just another rejection. Have you? Did you look through the introduction of that book at all? I actually got it. It was a a, a compilation book. It was one that was on Google. Oh, okay. Books. So it was only a chapter. It was only the chapter on rhizomes that I, I got this it's, from. It's the craziest book in the whole wide world. Like yes. it really is. But it's okay. We don't need to understand it. Yeah. So the, the really that, that thing essentially is just boundary breaking. It's just, in my mind, it's always been, oh, look, music. And this is what we're talking about. We're breaking all the boundaries through and we're not doing this in any way that reflects the normal way of doing it. That's always been my interpretation of it. But uh, I don't really know. I look at it and go, meh, oh yeah, it's the picture. It's the picture. What does it mean to you, Leslie? You're a musician. Well, yeah, actually, uh, you know, uh, I have a lot of friends who have gone and done classical training in music, in voice, in piano, and all of these kind of things. And they find that when they, when they do classical training, because it's, uh, it's a very specific style that you're trying to reproduce, and it's extremely technical, that... For a lot of people, they end up losing their own style, losing their own voice in trying to um, reproduce this classical style and that kind of thing. So to this, this kind of says to me, yeah, you know, whatever the classical style was, we're just going to, you know, leave that behind and, and make our own music. <laughs> Forget the rest of you. <laughs> It kind of resonated with me because uh, we had a, a person who did a blog post and he was he was critiquing the rhizomatic method, which I don't think I want to get into what it is because I've already watched it twice. People can watch all the other times that you've done the elevator pitch, David. And, and yeah, I think you've explained it enough. I want to kind of explore the idea practically and talk about uh, what it means to us and how we see it fitting in with either our approach or a vision or I think Bonnie said it really nicely just sort of it's just a way of looking at things it's a lens so, yeah a lens so I would like to just talk about how how we could use that and then um, and Zach could talk about his teaching and learning and also his uh, and and musically too because Zach and Leslie and Alan if he ever joins us both everybody is kind of in this process of learning an instrument and getting better at their craft of playing music so, yeah yeah. yeah. This uh, this the graphic that's on screen now reminds me of uh, this is kind of a, a um, in in avant garde and, and experimental music circles. This is actually this looks exactly like something you would do for a, a people do this kind of thing all the time where they get in, uh, instrumentalists together who are in the in the experimental thing and then they they craft these sort of um, for lack of a better word, these scores that don't uh, that don't apply the conventions of standard musical notation, and then say everyone on your mark and set play. Oh. And um, so this is actually kind of and and I play in, in noise and experimental and ambient acts, and we do this kind of something that looks like this all the time. We say so at this point we're sort of here, and then we'll go down here, and so it's not it's not about musical notation. It's about um, it's about the feeling or about a. One wants to I think it's really interesting. Well, David Tudor was an American pianist and composer of experimental music, and his name is on that picture. So I think that um, I think we're pretty safe to assume that you're you're right. It's a piece by David Tudor, and uh, blah 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 blah. Yeah, did lots of crazy choreography stuff. So yeah, that's what it is. Cool. That's awesome, but actually that, yeah, that's a good point, Zach, about your noise, like when you're, um, the magic of the ordinary, when you do your circuit bending, the kind of no noise that you make outside of the regular realm. I asked Zach and, and Leslie to bring their, um, their instruments too, just in case they felt like, you know, playing that score right now. <laughs> it's not written in tablature, I don't know how to play it. <laughs> So what was the instrument that Yap, was his name Yap? It, he was playing a, a clarinet. clarinet. I think, yeah. yeah. And he was like, how can I make this apply? And then you had a good response to it. What did you say? Uh, nah, dirty. Um, 
what did I say? Do you want um, me to tell you what you said? No, no, it's okay. I, I, I can say what I would say now. Um, That's I tend really not to lie. I tend not to lie because I can't remember what I've said, so I'm usually pretty good, even if I make it up a second time. Um, I, I don't think that you can go and, and sort of do the the B minor thing, which is where I am right now, and do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, as some teachers will tell you to do in order to get it down. But that doesn't help you do a transition. It doesn't help you understand where the B minor actually fits when you're playing. You can go, oh, it's a one four five thing. You do the blah blah blah, but that's not the same thing as integrating into a musical process and learning how that chord can be manipulated and changed and when you need to actually strum it when you know in order to make it sound right and to me those are very very different ways of approaching learning music so i would say using again bonnie's language from today using the rhizomatic lens on what he's talking about i would say well it's the difference between hitting a b minor 47 times to try to do the muscle memory thing or playing songs that you know, almost uniquely used B minors that force you to think about how it involves, how it's actually connected to the music. And that's sort of the shift that I'm always trying to make is, okay, yeah, sure, there are things you need. I, I, the B minor only works in the four or five positions that you can use, or maybe there's 20, I don't know. But, and those are technical things, but how they actually fit in and how they're actually part of the larger whole is a completely different question. You might as well learn it as part of the whole. Cool. And we've just been joined by Brian Jackson. Are you are you actually teaching guitar class right now? <laughs> Watch this for just one second, actually. This is great. <laughs> nice. Well, how do I aim it properly? <laughs> so Brian Jackson is out in BC at a, and he teaches a an enrichment, grade ten and nine and ten class, and part of their lunchtime they um. He teaches them guitar. Very cool. I, no, this is class. This is, so this is your actual class? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and actually, actually, none of those guys are in my class, but there's an extra room. <laughs> Just random class. dudes over there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brian, what are your learning objectives? Today? <laughs> yes. Uh, today, they have to pick the song that they're going to perform in two and a half weeks. So we've done one of our performances. Uh, and they basically need to pick their groups and take the feedback that I gave them last time, which almost across the board was find people who play other instruments, find people who don't mind singing, uh, find someone who wants to shake a tambourine, you know, kind of, kind of like what we were just talking about, bring the other pieces together. I need to mark you playing guitar, um, but to make it sound better, to make, you know, the learning go, I think, easier, um, you know, bring the other pieces together. How do you measure that? How do you uh, measure have, their success? Uh, I have sort of a fallback rubric, but it's mostly uh, it's mostly comments. Um, and you know, I, I teach a really loosely defined introduction to guitar. So it's um, you know, if you're if you're better at guitar than when you showed up in September, then we win. <laughs> so hopefully that you know puts them on a path to maybe playing more guitar, maybe finding out that. No, I'd rather be a violin player, or a pianist, or a piano. Golfer. Yeah, <laughs> golfer, exactly. <laughs> Brian, how, how is this preparing them for the, the job market? Uh, well, that is what I think about, you know, 24 hours a day. Um, I don't know, although it does say on my resume that I know how to play lots of Beatles songs on the guitar. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure that has appealed to someone somewhere. Uh, who gave me a job. I don't know if that's the, it's not the lead item, but, um, you know, people who are, are familiar with instruments and who, who have a musical side of themselves that they nurture, I think that's a, that's a certain sort of identifier you can put up as a, you know. Brand. Brand, yeah, exactly. A brand. Part of, part of your overall, uh, just, you know, one of, the, one of the flags that you fly so that, you know, you, you can go. be identified by people that you might want to work with, right? Not only that, but I mean, Playing, playing music with other people takes, uh, you know, communication skills. You have to be able to listen to what somebody else is doing in order to play along with them and have it sound anything decent. And so you get, mm -hmm. you get those kind of conversation skills, even though it's not happening verbally, it's, you know, hap happening in a musical way. Yeah, totally. How about you, Zach? You're learning banjo, right? Cool. <laughs> I am learning that. 
Have, are you doing a, a specified route? No, I just pick up a banjo and play it. It's really interesting because uh, I've played stringed instruments all my life, but banjo is different, and so I have no idea why it works. And, and when things work, I have no idea what, for what reason they work. I don't understand the relationships of the strings or the or the way scales work or any of that. But sometimes you just strike certain combinations and they sound really good. Did you? And I haven't gone back to to try and figure it out either. I just sort of know what worked and. Uh, so it's real different. I don't have any need or feeling need to understand exactly what the chords are or why they work. They just seem to work. That's how I'm approaching it. <laughs> but how will you replicate that? Muscle memory. Is that method scalable? Very good. Very it is good. not scalable. <laughs> <clears throat> Say something. Sorry. Oh, Alan. <laughs> Dog, dog. What's going on, buddy? Is he above everybody? Too? Hey, man. <laughs> I, I keep eyeing Canada. <laughs> nice. Am I muted? We, we got space for you, dude. We've always got space for you here. This is by far the most Brady hangout I've ever been in. Hey, Alan. Until I shut up. So I have an issue. Oh, you lost your audio, Julia. Yeah. You. I'll mute you. I said I issued a remix challenge, and I wanted. Uh, I was hoping all my musician friends would come forward and, and play like uh, a song and, and and put a narrative to my video, but but none of you have done it yet. Well, I'll week. tell you what. Bonnie is still in the process of writing one. A narrative. There, a, a song. A song. Yes, I have been challenged inside the house. I can't tell you what it is. I will <laughs> tell you that it will be very badly played. I will sing it out of tune, and when you hear it, you will laugh. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> That's awesome. I thought, you know, either we could do some kind of, um, didn't you, Dave, you, you were the one who laid down the first Petcha Flicker challenge. Yes. That we could play something like that, you know, and, and I would make you watch my video and you had to do it live with instruments right now. I would do that. Would you? Why not? So if I got Zach to play banjo, Brian Jackson's class to play their guitar, and Leslie to play ukulele, and then you do a narrative and I play the video. You ready? <laughs> All at once. We'd have to do that synchronously. Can I see the, uh, can I watch the video while it happens at least? Well, it's in there, right? I don't see it. Oh, sorry. It's on um, page, yeah. I don't know what page it is. Four or five? Oh. You mean on the slide thing. So, uh, Timmy boy, you have to make a go to that document too. Now, I think I didn't, I think I loaded the one without the, the one with audio, unfortunately. But So, Timmy boy, you'd have to mute it. I think it's four. I just see a five. screenshot. Page five. I don't even know what you're talking about now. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to watch the video, I think, separately, because I don't know what you guys are talking about. Are, it's on my... On a... Do you have the document loaded? Document loaded. The rhizome document? document? Oh, the one that something... go to page five. Page of do... Oh, up here in the documents. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, look at that. Are you able to start it for us, Julia? No, I wish I could, but this is a rhizomatic environment where I have no control. So we all have to press start at the same time? Is that the idea? Well, the audio part, um, you're just doing the words, right, Dave? You don't have an instrument. Just my voice. Just your <laughs> voice. So really, the music... Yeah, I guess we all have to push to start at the same time. Oh, You'll man. also have to mute the video because it's got the um, the audio that I included. One second. I didn't actually know that this many instruments would show up, so what, are you going to dance? <laughs> You're doing science so before this. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, no. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, somebody should dance. I once saw someone dance the I Have a Dream speech. It was fantastic. Where's Jim Groom when we need him? To dance. Well, Alan's doing some kind of bird thing. He's going to do some hand jive. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Convertible. Only has one. <laughs> Where's your banjo, Zach? Oh, come on. 
noise. Yes. It was not very far away. Is everything everything where you are that nearby? <laughs> you just have to go off screen and it's there to pick That's up it. and come back? This is, this that was is like how I've organized my life. <laughs> that was a prop. You got to tell me, there are 14 people sitting off stage with random stuff to hand you, aren't there? Exactly right. <laughs> you ever played that game Scribble Knots? No. Anyone? It's a uh, Nintendo game where you just draw whatever it is you want. And it... Never that sounds fun, though. It's quite good. Do they, they come like become real? Yeah. I remember watch, uh, that used to be a show when I was a kid. Scribble knots. The things I draw come true. Oh yeah, my name, you know, my name is Simon, Simon yeah. and his chalk drawings. He went over the garden wall. Yes. Won't you yeah. take me, take me over? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I'm hey, Timmy boy, are you going to play your uh, iPad? Hey, Timmy, yeah, are you going to play your iPad? Learning is not a spectator sport. Come on. Pull it together, man. Jeez. Yeah, I don't know who. Oh, it was Jim that was telling you that that's not real playing. I argued that. I argue that too. It's beautiful. You're really good with it, Tim. You gotta show us the change. We're like Come building, on. building songs. Bring the change. Cool. Where's the change, Timmy? Where's the change? I think there was that video I saw where they were using um, margarine tubs as drums. That's good. I don't have a margin tub. Here, use this. I'm just going to, I'm going to shut my office door. I have a feeling I'm going to be shouting here in a second. <laughs> Can we get a little deliverance? Is this the model of all cards? <laughs> I have to, because I play with a banjo player normally, hey? And so, of course, I've figured out. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Everybody. Ready. Rhizomes at your uh, mycorrhizal tips. <laughs> you ready? Okay, push play. Okay. Ready. Yeah. Oh, that's for the musicians. Learning. Here we are today, folks, and we've come here at the Rhizomatic Learning Experience Coloring. Oh, look, and there's these beautiful roots coming out the bottom. And it's a question to keep me going. It's a question. Why do we teach? This is the... Apparently, we teach for this guy. He's got a hammer and an axe and a, and a, and a card. He's a card... He's the trading cards. He's a job card. And we've got a soldier card. And he's a replicate card. And he's shooting at us. Jock! Nomads. He's shooting at the nomads. He's going to replicate the nomads. He has a replicator gun coming at the nomads right now. I think it's the... Here he is. Another gun. He's got a spiral. He's complying with the soldier. And now we're creating our way up the front. We're finding a pathway. This is the escape plan. We've got to get out of here right now. It's getting out of control. And if we follow the dots to the city of the map, and it's and it's all better now. The light bulb is turned on. The idea is back. And the answer is the fire. We have to sit around the campfire. That's the message we've been given, folks. The smoke of truth will come off the campfire and power our future telephones. Will give us the answers to all of our balding questions. We can color our shirts and footsteps to the future. To future knowledge. To recognize the things that we can do. And the button that will find our Google Maps of Rise Medical. Starring a whole bunch of people here on the internet. <laughs> well done, Dave. <laughs> to so all of our balding the gauntlet questions. you have laid it. <laughs> You've set a whole new standard for uh, uh, cacophony. cacophony. <laughs> 
I really appreciate how you guys rose to the uh, to the panic of that whole situation. It's really good. <laughs> I was like, if I start to sound panicked, then they get, oh yeah, they they've got it down. That's all good. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's what I tried to uh, kind of do my own narration for the for the video. I found it also. I was like, ah, ah, the drawing is happening so quickly. How do I? How can I possibly express what I what I have to say about this as it as it goes by so quickly? Quick. But I find people don't have an attention more than two minutes, so it's hard to to strike that balance. Okay, before before we cut out, I did want to talk to some of the, the critiques so far. Did you do you have time to talk about that or not? I, I sure do. I just see that uh, Bonnie is looking for a way into this conversation. That'd be great. It's yeah. open. She may she said not that she know had... how to get here. Did you invite her? Uh, I see. No, she told me she was busy. <laughs> <laughs> so I Look I who comes her. crawling back. I will invite her. What's her email? <laughs> Uh, great question. <laughs> you know what? I don't think I have her in my circles. Hold on. No. Where's the direct link to this hangout? There's one here somewhere. Invite. I, I did make it a public hangout, so yeah. you should see in your stream that you're in that chat. Yeah, that's true. I think that's going to help. Yeah. Is there a direct link for this? I don't know how I'll do Jeff that. Jeff always sends us a direct link. They do too, don't they? Can you just take the, the URL that's in the browser? Would that work? I'm going to try. Um, trying. There it is. Thanks, Timmy. Timmy! Hey, Jim Stafford's here. Jim did the first, uh, well, one of the first remixes. Hi, Jim. Way up, far up north, where you are. Oh, yes? Jim In this is, Arctic land. Yeah. Where are you, Jim? <laughs> it's like sinking. Can you hear okay, Jim? Maybe not. Somebody's getting Skyped. No, that was me. Um, she's probably at the house. She may not be near the computer, but if I call the computer, it'll make her go, what's he bothering me about? Which will <laughs> attract her attention. You guys have a system. <laughs> this has yeah. got to be um, the most chaotic hangout I've ever been in, actually. I love it. <laughs> Onward, you had questions. Topics, discussion. Uh, well, I was wondering about the critique. Oh, in particular, I wanted to talk about uh, Terry Anderson, mm -hmm. who kind of connected Edupunk, which I found disturbing, but th we won't talk about that specifically. His um, first, his critique was, actually, I had the slide for it. Let me pull it up so I don't get it wrong. He said he was alienated because there was so much uh, cynicism about the education system when you asked the question, what is education for? Mm -hmm. And I put the slide in, actually, slide four, if everybody wants to go to slide four. I took a, a screen capture of what people said, why do we educate students? Because people, he focused on what of, uh, like a lot of the negative comments, but there were some positive comments. Innovate, too. solve problems, evolve. Yeah. And actually, I don't find the perpetuate norms thing particularly a negative. I think of it as a, as neither good nor bad. It just happens to be the thing that we do. Anytime you, you instruct anybody with anything, you're perpetuating a norm. I mean, that's what the process is. If you're saying this is the way that people do things, you're perpetuating a norm. I mean, that may be how they answer the, the telephone properly. It may be, you know, how we drive a car. Um, yeah. So there's no way. Um, I, I don't see most of those things. I mean, some of them certainly are negatives. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about reforming education here. At some point, you've got to be able to say that you don't like something. Well, so, some of the critiques were pretty, some of them were very scathing, I thought. So, uh, and, I un and I felt that way, too. In fact, if you look at the picture, it says uh, when somebody wrote, to make good factory workers who can follow written instructions. That was, that's why we educate students. And then I, um, I wrote Cynic underneath. That was me who wrote Cynic, because I thought that was very cynical. But there, I thought there was a lot of really positive statements in there. Yeah, I mean, there's no real doubt that our education system was originally formed with that in mind. 
Um, I, I don't think that's a particularly cynical statement. It's true. Uh, you know, you look at the documentation in the House of Commons in England in the 1840s. I mean, that's what they were doing. They were trying to create an education system that would allow people to make the transition to the requirements that you had in stuff like the Salt Air Factory. If you go, I mean, they needed to show up at a specific time. You look at the town of Salt Air in, in, um, in England. It has, you know, people live on different streets, and each street is one of the, or they don't now, but at the time, each street was a different um, a shift. So as long as the people for this shift came in at 745 and the other guys left by the other street, it was perfect. But in order to get that, in order to get there, people had to be retrained, you know? And, I mean, yeah. they spent, you look at the floors in Salt Air. There are places where the floor is worn down three, four inches where people walk back and forth day after day after day after day on a seven-foot run, right? There was nothing in civilization up to that point that had trained people to do those things. And that's, that's what those, part of what those schools were set up for, was to be able to allow people to learn, this, the, to be trained in a way to be able to do those things. There's no real doubt about that. Um, when you talk about, um, the, I, a couple times in your presentations, you say you can't name who, who said that. I'm almost certain it's Ken Robinson in his How Schools Kill Creativity. There's a section where he talks about the Industrial Revolution and how students have been trained for I that. I think it was before that. Something tells me something David Warlick said about 10 years ago. Because Warlick still says a lot of stuff like that. Something tells me I heard Warlick say it at one point. I just wish I could. Um, I Maybe people have been saying it since the Industrial Revolution. They may have. <laughs> they may have. Uh, we also got a, a critique from the, um, George Hobson in El Salvador. He was he, he this, the metaphor didn't work for him either. Mm, I wrote back to him today too. Yeah. Um, the the comment that I had for him, if I can find it, was. Um, you know, again, there has to be room for critique. Um, and we don't sort of take a look at how the education system is structured without saying, without talking about the problems with it. Um, I, should we not? And the cynicism he was complaining about was that, that that's not the appropriate way of talking about the educational system, or are you saying that there's nothing about the education system we should be critiquing? Because I think the mistake that both or at least the way in which I was obviously not clear enough. And I think when you do this over and over again in one week, you get to the point where you start thinking that the people listen to the last conversation, so you don't make some of the same premises. And I think that was kind of a problem there too. For me, I'm not talking about taking a torch to our existing education system and burning the buildings down and replacing them with a park. You know, I'm saying that we need to ask ourselves what exactly the education system is for and if in that education system, to me, the most important thing is that people come out of it being able to uh, be empowered, to have the ability to take things in their own directions, to be critical thinking, that, that's the reason we educate. The other stuff doesn't go away. It's just not the primary thing that we're trying to do. I'm not saying burn everything else and just teach people how to use a compass. Um, and I think both of them kind of took the metaphor a little, particularly Terry, but took the metaphor a little further than it was intended for me. Yeah. And again, it's a metaphor. I'm not suggesting that we all actually walk around through the sands in the Omanian desert, which, you know, it's funny. After that, that I had a conversation with a friend of mine who spent three years teaching in Oman uh, in the desert right after that quote. And I'm like, is, what he's, is that the way that nomads are? And he's like, well, that's one interpretation of it. Uh, the other one is that those people he's talking to are trying to structure things so that their kids are as colonized. Or, like they're actually, when they say education, they mean colonized, right? They mean education so they can have advantages to have all of these sort of things that weren't part of their country at all 50 years ago. So it's a deeper question than that about how nomadism has changed in Oman. And like everything, right? If you start digging too deep in the metaphor, it goes all crazy on you. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't think we're suggesting that people just wander aimlessly around. And I love that uh, one person actually said it has nothing to do with wandering aimlessly. Yes, that's right. And that's yeah. why that quote is in there. Yeah, no, that's right. It's to like sort it. of scoop that up. Uh, and that was one of the students from ECI through A31 who wrote that. In my yeah, blog. that was good. Yeah, that's very good. But Leslie, you you connected your. Um, sort of nomadic tendencies to, to your learning experience. I remember when you're going across Canada. 
Yeah, yeah, in, in the videos. Um, but also, yeah, I just wanted to comment that, you know, I, I, um, you know I've done a, a couple of different international programs where I've been a student on the program. And um, some of them have, have uh, ended up fairly well and some of them haven't. And, you know, it, because you're out in the world and you're, and you're you know, quote, wandering about or, or looking at, at an entirely different space, I think the, that by the end of you know, an experiential international outdoor learning um, program, students should have um, the basic skills necessary to make them feel confident in going out and doing this on their own. And some of, my, some of the programs I've been a part of have really done that. Some of them have convinced me, you know, even though I've traveled quite extensively and by myself a lot of the time, some of them, by the end, I, I was afraid to be traveling by myself in that country afterward, which is, you know, to me is a huge red flag going, whoa, wait a second, if you've, if you've convinced me, who I'm normally, you know, quite uh, self-confident and, and that kind of thing in, in traveling, if you've convinced me to second guess my ability, like, <laughs> that's, that's com that you're way off in the wrong direction. And I mean, it's it's the same with everything, right? Like, it's it's important to kind of address those bits that happen for the worker and for the soldier type learning. But I mean, I think you're exactly right, Dave. That you know, if you're if you're not trying to transition your students into a space of self sufficiency where they can begin to ask questions for themselves and not only ask the questions but start to see the forces around them that affect that question, that affect the outcomes, then like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I, I think the Latour's ideas around black boxing are really useful to talk about that. And I found that uh, I've, people have been telling me for years that so much of what I'm doing is, is, is in Latour. Um, but when he talks about, you look at any kind of thing that becomes accepted, the more something becomes accepted, the less we worry about what it really is. Right? So if you have a concept that's just become part of the common dialogue, and you see this to some degree with the people who, um, who advocate for trickle-down economics, um, they don't actually, we're not actually referencing back to what it actually means anymore. It, it reifies, right? The concept just goes into a sentence and people go, oh, that thing means that, and we forget about it. World War, World War II started in 1939. Um, what does that even mean? You know, when you actually break it down, you dig into it, there's a lot of context in there, and it's even more so in science. But when you have an education system that starts people from the black box, and then at some point later on you say, well, actually, all those things weren't true. And I have any number of colleagues who've gone through, particularly the science uh, education programs, only to get to the end of their PhD and realize that all the things they were taught as truths aren't. And then they just pull the rug out from under you. Well, actually, you know, it's not really any of that stuff at all. And to me, that's the problem that you have whenever you teach it too simple at the beginning where you actually aren't, your goals aren't to have people understand the concepts. Your goals are to um, have people be able to replicate what you just said, right? And to me, that's where the whole thing falls apart. Bonnie can't get in. Oh, it's like she can't connect to G plus or she can't can't get into G plus. Yeah, it's funky. This is where technology uh, is a limiting factor. Sure, it is. About just you know, it strangles the conversation a little bit. I really liked her her post. I would lo love to have her in on this conversation. You're lucky to have her as a <laughs> genius partner. Taskmaster. <laughs> no, just somebody that you can really bounce your ideas off of, right? Yeah, like, I know. Well, it's it, the thing that we're jabbing about today is true. She actually introduced me to Deleuze. Um, oh, yeah, uh, I was supposed to get that on video. You're recording <laughs> that, Timmy? You got that? Yeah, and she still has yet to understand him. <laughs> He's not supposed to be understood. Yeah, Therefore, she understands him more than she should. Exactly. <laughs> you hit it on the head. Oh, Zach had to go, too. Where is he saying that to Brian? This is not a tidy start and end, which is perfect for rhizomatic uh, session, right? Well, there you go. 
<laughs> we were going to give you a rhizome badge, but it wouldn't be round. It'd be just sort of like... <laughs> just kind of a splotch. A splotchy kind of inner organic kind of looking thing. Yeah, I think broadly to sort of address the sort of... I'm looking at the slides now, the stuff that you had set up. Um, mostly where the I see the criticism in this is in people taking it as a theory that then needs to be translated into practice that then has check mark one, check mark two, check mark three on it. And it's really not about that. I mean, do I have to eventually at some point translate this into practice? Yeah, and I do in my classrooms. And I can tell you how that's done. For me, it's going to be completely different for somebody else. <laughs> because, I, and I mean, I think this is always true of teaching. I mean, we all have different strengths. I mean, I haven't, I've never seen, um, I've seen Alan present. Alan has this wonderful storyteller tone. He's got this kind of, you know, and he's, you know, he's got a little fire set up on his computer, and he's got this. He can lecture because you, you want to listen to him, right? You want to just sit there and go, "Wow, yeah, that's really neat." Some people don't have that, and if you don't, there's no sense having you try to do that thing. I had a prof in, in university who taught a class. One of my favorite in terms of content classes I ever took. It was called didactic literature. And this is a guy who understood exactly the steps of the thing he was supposed to do. He would, I mean, we, it was a beautiful course. We did the Mabinogian, we did uh, the Bhagavad Gita, we did the Bible, and we did them all as literature, and we did them all as didactic literature. So we took each piece and said, you know, what kinds of themes are emerging from this, and what is it trying to teach us? It was, it was wonderful curriculum. But when he tried to tell the stories, he would jump up on the desk and stuff, but he was kind of always awkward. He couldn't really tell a story, and he couldn't really do it, but he kept trying to do the moves, and he'd go, ta-da-da. <laughs> and you'd be like, this is 110 people feeling really awkward for him because he seemed like a really nice man, but it's just he was trying to do something that wasn't him. And I think good teaching is always a place where you, you find inside yourself the things that, that work for you and that come together for you. And... You know, that's where uh, Alan's 50 different things stuff is so useful because over the 50, you find something that fits for you. There's no way. And that's with this kind of lens, right, if it, if it helps you, and it, it has for a couple people where they've written back and said, you know what, I had this suspicion. That my favorite one from the list this week, there's a woman who is a corporate trainer in um, the Netherlands who wrote and said, you know, about I, when I first started corporate training, I used to make these giant PowerPoint slides, and I used to tell, sit down for two full days and tell people what they should do. And it was tedious. It was terrible. It was boring for me. It was boring for them. And at one point, I threw all that away, and I stood down in the middle of the room, and I started. And it was fine. But again, she knows what she's talking about. She's a professional. You can't just do that if you don't have any connection to anything. But at that point, when you accept that people know stuff, that it's not about secret knowledge. Everybody can pull that together. And it's about drawing people out and pulling them together. That's exactly what it was for her. And in reading the stuff that I wrote, she went, now I feel like it's OK for me to accept it, to admit that that's actually what I'm doing. Because she still kind of prepares the materials anyway and just doesn't look at them. But she feels the need to have them carried around with her because it's kind of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have objectives and goals and stuff. But realistically, for her, it just wasn't necessary. and. Uh, it's like, I think of Obama. Um, here's a man who can present a written speech better, like, the way that man, he reads off a teleprompter, uh, it's amazing. Like, he's, he's just unbelievable. But he's not very good, or at least he hasn't been, the stuff that I've seen, without one. So, you know what? Let him spend four, eight, I don't know if he writes his own speeches or not, I don't know if anybody does that anymore, but let him organize his thoughts somewhere else, and let because it fits, right? And that's, Hopefully, that's what this does, is it allows people to find a place to fit. So because of that, I can't say what it is. I can't say, do this from there, because it's not going to work for everybody. Yeah. Well, I think Keith Hammond had a really good response about He's not so putting... smart. Yeah, He's no, so smart. I love the noodle metaphor. I put a couple pictures up there of, of noodles, because it made me think of them um, on slide 14, if anybody wants to see it. And he talks about... Um, how if you take the noodle and, and try and pin it down it just i just made me think of the dissecting the frog right and splitting open the noodle and looking at it and then it's just not really what we're talking about to, to dissect it in such a way is that his his post yeah it's good mm -hmm. that's his blog his blog yeah yeah super smart dude 
Yeah, it's been interesting to watch all the connections. There's so many people talking about it that it was hard to almost keep up with, which is good to have a mm. healthy debate. It is, it is. And, it, and again, and it's funny, at the end of the post, the second one that we talked about earlier where they were didn't connect with the metaphor, he sort of tailed it off with maybe just the discussion is what the point is. And I'm like, it is. You know, it, and, and yes, again, like I say, if if I'm put in a corner and you hold a, you hold a beaver to my head and say, tell us how this gets done in the real world, I can kind of talk about that for me. But there's no real sense in doing that because I've got no interest in saying, this is the way you're supposed to do it. Because I don't think that's translatable. It's not very rhizomatic, is it? You can talk Dog about dog's it. just nodding at me. I love it. I know. Well, then we're in the same room, so the audio is a shared thing. But I think you can hear him. Talk. Say something and see if it works. I'm barking. Bark, hey, bark. I'm you can see that tonight. I'm listening right now. Uh, just, um, yeah, it's just not a thing you can, like, manufacture, adopt, and have that checklist, like you said. To me, it's just the way of being. And all the people on this call are rhizomatic to me. I mean, it's just the way they operate. And that's why I hang out with them. So, yeah, you know, I... It, it's, t it's so easy to fall into that metaphor. I mean, because that's why you create it. something that people can, can picture and they can sort of associate. But as soon as you start talking about plants and networks and you find the things that don't fit, um, I mean, that's the bind of all metaphors. So, you know, I, I love them and, and I get hung by my own as well. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and like you say, Dave, I mean, the whole point was just bring this out. And, I mean, to me, you know, I, I barely tagged with any of the new stuff so far, but I mean, it looks like. I mean, this has been some rich provocation that, that you've done this week. Yeah, I think so. And, and I have to salute you. The way, the way you follow through on everything um, in terms of interpreting and, and reacting to everything is, is, is the model for, for what people should be doing. Well, you know, if you only got to commit to it for a week, it's not too bad. I wouldn't want to have to do it over the long haul, I'll tell you that. <laughs> 40 um, weeks. Yeah, oh, man. Uh, but, you know, what's really, it's easily the best privilege that I've had as an academic. If so-called, really, because I don't think I'm a real one, if there is such a thing. I know it's not me. <laughs> um, is that I've got lots of really, really smart people, you know, coming after the stuff that I'm doing and saying, you know, what Dave is trying to say is blah, 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 blah. And I'm looking at him like, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I... Totally illogical. Totally <laughs> what I was trying to say. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, copy, paste... Yeah, and, and that's been really fun. I mean, and that's one of the things, and not to get out there, but that's one of the things about post-structuralism, right, is that I'm not claiming that everything's true. So there's no sense in me defending myself as true. Right? I, here's a narrative. If this narrative is helpful for you, then take it. And if it's not, tell me what I can do. And if that changes my narrative, fantastic. If it doesn't, well, then we go have a beer and talk about something else. You know, and that's, it's taken me a while to get there because I used to be more defensive. It's funny, I was talking to Nancy White about this on Skype a couple hours ago. I said, you know, I'm finally not reacting. I'm finally able to go, hey, that's great. You've said that. I can see where you're coming from in this. I think you misunderstood what I meant here. And after that, what are you going to do? Just let it go, yeah. Yeah. I, I think you should, um, you should go full-on narrative and make it a, a fable. Mythical. <laughs> yeah, that smacks of work, though. That's like creative writing. That's like editing and stuff. Can I just, you know, turn on a microphone and go blah, blah, blah for an hour? Because yeah, that's way easier. Which is what we've done. We already had to lose Leslie, and I don't know. I just want to thank her for coming. <laughs> so um, how are we doing for time? Does everybody have to? Should we be winding this up? You're exactly. always good to keep to the hour. It always people start to get wandery after that. How about the um, the connotations of nomad? Because that's a little bit latent too. Yeah, it, it's a funny one because it's it's one of the newer things that I started because I was looking for the problem with the whole metaphor is that which part of the thing are you are you giving the metaphor to? Right. So are you saying that? The rhizome is the learning part? Are you saying it's the knowledge part? Is it the people? Is it the what? And, you know, I asked that same question to George, George Siemens, the other, last week about networks. I'm like, okay, when you say network, 
do you mean the network of people? Are you talking about the, well, I mean all of those things. Okay, yeah. Well, you use them differently, okay? And I'm, of course, guilty of the same thing. I accuse him of it, but it's a transference. Um, but what I needed to do is find a way to talk about the person in the process. Because what I've always seen come out of this, and I used to, I, the first stuff I wrote was far more community based. And what I've learned more and more is that the critical part of the process is personal responsibility. You yourself have to be willing for yourself to go and do, to get engaged. I mean, you talk about, uh, was Timmy boy down there was too lazy to take out his phone and play on it. He um, played it. And you said, and you, yeah, yeah, but you said, you know, it's not a spectator sport. Because every, and everybody who picks up an instrument in the middle of that, whether they're tapping on a margarine tin or whatever else, has to bring something of their sel themselves to the process. Mm -hmm. And that was what was missing in the earlier ways that I was talking about it, is how do I account for the person outside of that? Because you can have all the communities and all the connections and all the things in the world, if you don't get off your butt and get in the car and drive around North America hanging out with people, say, um, um, then you're not, you're not going to, you're not, nothing's going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. And that to me, when I look at the, the kinds of um, pacification and alienation and the inability of people to engage in serious discourse, which are all things that I find very frustrating and, and my whole investment in the education industry is in trying to look at kids my kids age and go, how do we make sure that when their government does foolish things, they go, that's kind of foolish. You know, that's the whole thing for me. That's the, that's the entire project. And to me, that's about giving them the tools they need to be able to sort of figure that out. And right now, our education system doesn't do that because we don't take the responsibility upon ourselves. Right? And that's where the nomad fits in for me, is that I need to carry the things that are going to keep me moving right, and I need to know what they are, and I need to know why I have them, you know, and why I made this decision. And it's about, it's about accountability, I guess, more than anything. And it's also like creating like the potential for opportunities to happen. Yeah. You know, you just constantly in the mix. Sorry, okay, well, my own feedback can hear myself. Um, just, just the, the more you do, the, the more things could possibly happen that are rising matter. And the more you sit back and watch, the least you're going to get out of it. That's right. I always think about the metaphor. I wonder about like why we don't use our own brains as the metaphor. The neuron, the, like on um, slide 15, I have a, it's uh, the neurons that shape civilization, mm -hmm. and they talk. This is where I, why I pulled Zach in because he's the one who introduced me to the Steve Johnson and the Jason Possible, and he talks about how. Our brains work like when we're sleeping, we, our, our neurons start um, sort of exploring different connections, ones that would not normally ever be connected together just to see if there's any kind of relationship. And that's sort of where like these new ideas come from. And then um, this TED talk, uh, which is on slide 15, he talks about how we, um, our neurons can actually fire in response to somebody else doing something. So when I said that learning is not a spectator sport, it's actually not true because you can watch somebody play guitar or, or do a, a manual task and your brain will do the same sort of thing as if you were doing it yourself. And that, and that is a form of learning is just by watching it. And I wonder about watching, you know, how you can explore things just by watching other people do things and think about things. And then in between that space are these new possibilities, which, uh, Stephen Johnson called the, the adjacent possible new ideas. I would so I would fight I would fight about your definition of spectator there. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think that you're picking up how to play the guitar by being a spectator. Um, I, I I I'll speak just from my own experience. I used to go and love watching old, took a run at it, but now play at the local pub jazz players play. You know, they play the tunes and they're playing along and about once a night, it's like old hockey players, about once a night, one of them would just lose his mind. And you're like, wow, I can't believe you just did that. But I watched very much as a spectator. I had no idea what he was doing. In the last year, in desperately trying to go clangy, clangy on my guitar, now when I watch people play, I go, ah, I see what's going on. And how did you get from there? Okay. And now, now I'm no longer a spectator. Now I've actually got enough of that sort of ground piece to be able to sort of at least gawk properly. 
Um, okay. So not spectator, but a gawker. Is it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and that's what um, I, I'm just finishing on the road in the park huh? where uh, they go into these jazz clubs, and, and Moriarty is saying, the it, the it, when, when, when like they're just going crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we're after. It's that Winter Marcellus quote that I that I keep quoting um, that I never I've always been too embarrassed to say where I've actually taken it from. Um, the quote, the Winter. Did you hear me use the Winter Marcellus quote the last couple of times? Anyway, Winter Marcellus says it's the isness. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a point that. at which you're no longer playing the notes and you're playing the music. And if you're thinking about the notes, you're not playing music. You're one step away from it, and you're not being it. And the truth is. It's a quote by Wynton Marsalis. That's no word of a lie. But it's, he's talking about Barry Sanders, the football player, and the way that he runs. And he's saying that's the difference between him and the way that anybody else has ever done this, is that he is completely connected. And if you ever watch, and it doesn't matter if you like football or anything, watch footage of the man move. It is unbelievable what he could do. Giant men who spent their whole lives training for this moment looking like children next to him, right? And there was a moment, like he, he talked about, he compared it to music and said, look, it's the same kind of thing. You can, and, and it's funny because they matched it up because Barry Sanders came in in the video compilation about a minute later and said, you have to turn your brain off. You have to get to that point where you let it all fade away and you become the thing. And it's that moment of becoming that to me is the real goal, one of the real goals of learning. That's what we're looking for, right? Is that moment when you go, ha, 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 I got it. You know, the first time I set a lobster trap so that it laid down properly. Um, there's no steps to that, but I can promise you there are no steps you can learn to that process. You know, you can, you actually have to be able to feel the current in the boat and, and you can't see it, but you can kind of sense it, right? And some of them are visual cues and uh, they're seeing, but there's a feeling that you get after a while where you kind of, you know, some of it's experience and visual and, you know, somebody was telling me today that the same guy uh, who worked in Oman, that he was... A buddy of his was in a, in a truck and they were going across the Omani Desert at 40 miles an hour. And the guy slows down, hammers on the brakes, gets out, takes out a stick and shoves it into the sand and comes out with a fox who's biting the stick. And the guy puts the fox in the back of the truck. Because the, Now, what was he looking at? What does he know? What are the things that go into that? There's a thousand things, right? But it's all sort of the process coming together. I think we're going to... I think we're at our hour, and we have to say goodbye to Zach. Thank you for coming, Zach. I'm sorry I didn't get you to say more stuff. <laughs> Bye, Julia. Thanks for having You're me. Bye, Jim. Nice Zach. to meet you. Jim nice to meet you, too, you. sir. Jim, it's a pleasure. Tom Dog, we'll see you soon. <laughs> so I think that was a very nice, messy um, session. I enjoyed that. Are you, <laughs> you going to clip? Of you, yeah. I hope uh, uh, Timmy. What, we'll see what Timmy can make us make available to us. Okay. It's all on you. Well, he doesn't have to. I don't know why I just didn't grab a screen cap. For I that. I was. I'm not very smart. I could have just grabbed that. Uh, great. Nice chatting, guys. Cog dog. Are we ever going to okay. see you out here? You said yeah. next summer, but. I'm, I'm hoping next summer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds great. All right, thanks for the talk and taking the extra time, Dave. I thanks appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Conference.